Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. Well, welcome to the sixth in this um, series of Darwin College lectures on the theme of beauty. Um, last week we explored the relationship between beauty and attraction. And I think my conclusion was that at best they're overlapping sets. There's clearly a lot that's very attractive to baboons but that isn't at all attractive, let alone beautiful to us. And this week the subject is beauty and happiness. What, if anything, is the relationship between them? I suspect most Westerners would be rather cautious about it. After all, we have a, a long tradition of having unhappy artists. But the question is very central to Chinese art and, and to Chinese philosophy. And our speaker tonight is an authority on that. Jason Kuo is Professor of Art History and Archaeology at the University of Maryland. He was trained at the National Museum in Taiwan and studied for his doctorate in uh, Michigan. And he's previously taught at Williams College and at Yale. He's written on Chinese art of all sorts, uh, calligraphy, painting, ceramics, and especially on 19th and 20th century art. It's a pleasure to introduce Jason Quill. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. When I was a postgraduate student, a uh, fellow actually at the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., in the late 1970s, every day I have to use an entrance hidden behind one of the walls of the pickup room to reach my small office. The pickup room was designed by the American artist James Whistler as the dining room for his English patron, Frederick Dillon, it was later dismantled and so eventually to Charles Freer. In 1923, it was reinstalled in the Freer Gallery of Art. Seeing the peacock room every day gave me ample opportunity to think about beauty and happiness. First of all, it compelled me to think about what the French writer Stendhal said on several occasions. Beauty is nothing other than the promise of happiness. It was also reminded me of what John Ruskin wrote in the Stones of Venice. Remember that the most beautiful things in the world are the most useless. Peacock and ladies, for instance. The blue and white porcelain in the pickup room also remind me of the China mania initiated by Whistler and his contemporaries in England. The fact that blue and white porcelain, most of it mass produced in Chinese factories to be exported to foreign countries and considered quite unremarkable by Chinese connoisseurs caused such a sensation in Europe since the 17th century as seen in the painting by the Dutch artist Karl. It also made me wonder if there is such a thing as universal beauty. Chinese porcelain has fired the imagination of many writers, including uh, T.S. Eliot, who saw it as alpha and omega of time in his poem, Brent Norton. I quote, words move, music moves only in time, but that which is only living can only die. Words of speech reach into the silence. Only by the form, the pattern, can words or music reach the stillness as a, still, a Chinese jar still moves perpetually in its stillness. Uh, if you look at this slide of details, and I'm asking you to take a quiz, from four Buddhist sculptures, from four different uh, sculpture, uh, culture, depicting either Bodhisattva or Buddha. 
we can ask at least two questions. First, how can we identify the places where they were made? The answer, of course, is this on the screen. I hope you make some good guesses. <laughs> Second question we can ask, which one is more beautiful and uh, why? We can reasonably assume that each work of art was made in accordance with the highest idea of beauty in each culture. And this slide also exemplifies the still unresolved issue of objectivity versus subjectivity in the concept of beauty. As Charles Darwin, who was very much aware of the diversity of beauty in life, put it once, if everyone were cast in the same mold, there would be no such thing as beauty. China has uh, one of the most uh, continuous development of artistic traditions in the world, and that tradition has contributed to the visual culture of the world, an endless stream of great masters, glorious monuments, and intriguing but understandable theories about art and beauty. China has also produced fascinating ideas about the pursuit of happiness. This evening, I would like to share ideas associated with the Taoist philosopher Zhuang Zi, who lived in the 4th century BC and whose ideas have been essential to the Chinese sense of beauty and the pursuit of happiness, particularly among the ancient elite. And Oscar Wilde, at once, was fascinated by Zhuang Zi, of course, as we all know. And uh, whenever I gaze at the goldfish swimming below the flying rainbow bridge in the 16th century garden in Suzhou, I am reminded of a parable from the book of Zhuang Zi. Zhuang Zi and Hui Zi were taking a leisurely walk along the river of Hao. When Zhuang Zi said, see how the white fish come out and dart around where they please. This is the happiness of fish. Hui Zi said, you are not a fish. How do you know it's happiness? Zhuang Zi said, you are not me. How do you know I don't know the <laughs> happiness of the fish? This story emphasizes Zhuang Zi's epistemological skepticism about intellectual knowledge, about happiness, and by extension, beauty. Another well-known passage from the Book of Zhuang Zi is that about the butterfly's dream and depicted in this 16th century painting. Once Zhuang Zi dreamed he was a butterfly, a butterfly fleeting and fluttering around, happy with himself and doing as he pleased. He did not know he was Zhuang Zi. Suddenly he woke up and there he was, solid and unmistakably Zhuang Zi. But he didn't know if he was Zhuang Zi, who had dreamed he was a butterfly, or a butterfly dreaming he was Zhuang Zi. Between Zhuang Zi and a butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is called the transformation of things. This passage clearly demonstrates Zhuang Zi's challenge to entrenched beliefs and moral discourse, it also emphasized the importance of transforming experience in the creation of art. I guess one way for me to share with you my thoughts on beauty and happiness is by looking at the series of paintings which should look familiar to those of you who visited the exhibition Three Chinese Emperors held at the Royal Academy of Art in London in 2006. They were painted by anonymous court artists for Prince Yinzhen, the future Yongzhen Emperor, who would rule China from 1722 to 1735. These pictures of beautiful women have been some of the most popular items in exhibitions organized for Western audience by the Paris Museum, perhaps because they seem to exemplify the idealized life of women and the ideal feminine beauty in China. The popularity of these pictures, however, also reveals the persistence of the Westerners' curiosity about what is behind the doors of the Forbidden City, where the Paris Museum is located. Many of the pictures actually contain sexual innuendo. In this example, one woman is courted by a pair of magpies 
who call to her through the window. Together, the makepeace represent a conventional sign for double happiness, a symbol of wedded couple. But in this picture, the woman sits alone, waiting for her happiness. The screen, truncated by the frame, features 100 forms of the same Chinese character, so or long life, often associated with the popular idea of fu, happiness. The popularity of this kind of picture with Western audience is not new, actually, starting with the Greek myth of the luxury and decadence of Asia through Marco Polo's account of the gorgeous East to the French writer Victor Segalen's literary encounter with and recreation of Chinese art in his writings, the story of Westerners' challenge, uh, changing image perceptions and uh, impressions and uh, constructions of Chinese art is a history of mutual misunderstanding and understanding between East and West. One of the most telling examples is Hegel's assertion on Chinese painting in his lectures in the 1820s on the philosophy of history, I quote, the Chinese have not yet succeeded in representing the beautiful as beautiful, for in their painting, shadow and perspectives are wanting. The exalted, the ideal, and the beautiful is not the domain of the Chinese artist, art and skill, unquote. We are not sure what Chinese painting Hegel might have been able to see, but he may have in mind a painting like this by Shen Zhou, one of the most important uh, masters of the 16th century, uh, which includes not only Shen Zhou's painting, but also his calligraphy and his poetry that he himself composed. Or Hegel might have seen a painting like this by Shi Tao, one of the greatest masters of the 17th century. In the writings on Chinese art by some of the most perspective modern art historians, and the critics, for example, Roger Fry, Clement Greenberg, Ernest Gombrich, and Arthur Dental, the trope of difference is unmistakable. Roger Fry is an example of the Western critics' uh, understanding as well as their difficulty in comprehending some unique aspects of the Chinese sense of beauty. Uh, Fry's shrewd insight into the Chinese sense of beauty can be seen in his appreciation of the rule wear from the Song Dynasty in an essay published in 1919. I quote, we appreciate gradually the shape of the outside contour, the perfect sequence of the curves, and the subtle modification of a certain type of curve, which it shows. We also feel the relation of the concave curves of inside to the outside contour. We realize that the precise thickness of the walls is consistent with the particular kind of matter of which it's made, its appearance of density and resistance. And finally, we recognize perhaps how satisfactory for the display of all these plastic qualities are the color and dual luster of the glaze. In one of his last lectures as a Slate professor at Cambridge, Fry compared Chinese art with the art of other ancient civilizations. But in early Chinese art, we shall find the balance between geometric regularity, sensibility is of an almost unique kind. I think we might say that no period in Chinese art has sens sensibility been completely repressed. The notion of organization of form and of its perfection has never with them implied, as it so often has elsewhere, the suppression of sensibility. As we will see in a minute, Chinese calligraphy occupies a unique and supreme position in Chinese art. Fry intuitively sensed its importance when he repeatedly talked about linear rhythm in Chinese art, he wrote. A Chinese picture never roses the evidence of the linear rhythm as the main method of expression, and this is only natural. The medium used being always some kind of watercolor, and the art painting being always regarded as a part of the art of calligraphy. A painting was always conceived as the visual record of a rhythm gesture. It was a graph of a dance executed by the hand. But he did not go any further in exploring the significance of calligraphy in the Chinese sense of beauty. 
keeping the clear, idea clearly in mind, I show you this photograph from 1956 when the Chinese artist Zhang Ding visited Paris. There he met Picasso. Picasso was later called as having remarked that had he been born Chinese, he would have been a calligrapher. Uh, this slide shows that Picasso understood the Chinese sense of beauty. Artists should not be bound by what the eye sees. They should just capture the essence. The importance of calligraphy in the Chinese sense of beauty raises important questions about the categorization of the arts and the problem of defining beauty in general. Of all kinds of Chinese calli calli uh, artifacts collected by Westerners, calligraphy has been the least understood, and until in the past few decades, there have been very few collections of Chinese calligraphy in Western museums. Yet it has exerted one of the strongest influences on 20th century Euro-American art. In 1938, Jiang Yi published his book on Chinese calligraphy on the basis of his lectures on Chinese calligraphy at the School of Oriental Studies, London University, during the Great International Exhibition of Chinese Art in London, 1935 to 36. A Chinese calligraphy has also been the source of influence, inspiration, and exploration for many modern and contemporary Euro-American artists, such as Pierre Solage, Jackson Pollock, Mark Tobe, and Bryce Martin, to name just a few, one may speculate the Chinese calligraphy, together with its ideogram, serve as a means to an end for the Western artists in their search for their own alternative aesthetics. There are super, superficial similarities between Pollock's painting and the 8th century Buddhist monk Huai Su's cursive hand scroll, dated 777, very easy to remember. Jackson Pollock's uh, painting, as we are going to see, is quite different, in fact. Why should work, as you see in one part of the scroll, is described as being done in a rapid, uninterrupted flow of darting, looping brush movement. Why should work, in addition to the formal quality of speed, improvisation and spontaneity is itself a discursive literary text, as we're going to see uh, in a moment. The scroll, of course, is to be looked at from right to left, but in a typical manner, you must read the text in reverse as you pick up the scroll because you really cannot leave it out all by itself. Let me just show you a few details to illustrate what I mean that the uh, work by Huai Su is a discursive literary art in addition to a visual work of art. The painting actually has very important uh, impressions of seals from the emperor, including the 18th century emperor, uh, Qian Long, who liked to put his seals on almost every work of art in the imperial collection, <laughs> and who also liked to uh, inscribe poems on Chinese paintings in the imperial collection. I mentioned earlier, there is a discursive aspect of this work. For example, Huai Su has quoted poetic couplets by three of his own contemporary critics. First, I, 
quote, at first, the characters appear as a mist gently descending over all the pines. Then they transform into peaks that cleave the sky. Second, the characters are like monkeys in winter, shaking up withered vines while drinking water. They are like strong men plucking up heels or flexing iron with all their might. This is a translation of this uh, quotation. When Huai Su set the brush down, one could only make out flashes of lightning. The characters completed. One was merely afraid. Coin dragon might rise up. Parak's work, however, is primarily appreciated for its non representational service. On the other hand, anyone who has some knowledge of the Chinese cursive script can retrace in the mind or even repeat on the paper the process in which Huai Su's work was originally done. Huai Su created this work in the cosmopolitan society of the Tang Empire and its flamboyant and self confident culture in the 8th century. Through its extremely dynamic and highly eccentric version of cursive script called Kuang Chao or Wild or Crazy Script, Huai Su came down in Chinese history as a paragon of beauty, aesthetic freedom, and excellence. Now, the story about the cook by the name of Din in the book of Zhuangzi is, is essential to our understanding of the Chinese, of Chinese sense of beauty in general and the beauty of this particular work. I quote, this is a wonderful story. Cook Din was cutting up an ox for Lord Winhui. At every touch of his hand, every heave of his shoulder, every move of his feet, every thrust of his knee, zip, zoop, he slithered the knife along with the zing and all was in perfect rhythm. Ah, this is marvelous, said Lord Winhui. Imagine skill reaching such heights. Cook Din laid down his knife and replied, what I care about is the way, or Tao, which goes beyond skill. When I first began cutting up oxen, all I could see was the ox itself. After three years, I no longer saw the whole of ox. And now, now I go at it by spirit and don't look at it with my eyes. Perception and understanding have come to a stop, and spirit moves when it wants. I go along with the natural makeup, strike in big hollows, guide the knife through the big openings and follow things as they are. So I never touch the smallest ligament or tendon, much less a main joint. A good cook changes his knife once a year because he cuts. A mediocre cook changes his knife once a month because he hacks. I have had this knife of mine for 19 years, and I have cut up thousands of oxen with it. And yet the blade is as good as though it had just come from the grindstone. There are spaces between the joints, and the blade of the knife has really no thickness. If I, you insert what has no thickness into such space, then there is plenty of room, more than enough for the blade to play about it. That's why, after 19 years, the blade of my knife is still as good as when it was uh, made. However, whenever I come to a competitive place, I size up the difficulties, tell myself to watch out and be careful, keep my eye on what I'm doing, work very slowly, and move the knife with the greatest subtlety until, flop, the whole thing comes apart, like a cloud of earth crumbling to the ground. I stand there, holding the knife, and look all around me, completely satisfied and reluctant to move on and then I wipe off the knife and put it away. Excellent, say Lord Winhui. I have heard the words of Cook Din and then how to care for life. Care for life in modern trans translation or interpretation is very close to the pursuit of happiness. So, in this uh, storage in uh, Zhuangzi, I think uh, we learn uh, how Chinese artists, in particular, and the Chinese philosophers, approach the issues of beauty and happiness. Perhaps I can show you another fascinating artist who exemplified the Taoist approach to art. Uh, this is the artist Wu Daozi from the 8th century. 
On the screen is an ink painting of Bodhisattva on cloth preserved in the Shoso Inn treasure house in Nara, Japan, since 756. Although it's not by Wu himself, it's a piece greatly influenced by his style. The remarkable work drawn in outline by brush with ink seems to echo the fluttering movement of the draperies of Wu's figure. Quite a few stone engravings have been suggested as probably being made based on the style of Wu Daozi. The work on the screen depicts a mountain spirit who, as the inscription on some, uh, the stone tells us, is flying down like a white devil with a spear. Swift as wind, he descends from the clouds to kill and to strike an agent of heaven who deals out punishment and clears up secrets so that the country and the people may be peaceful forever. The figure, with its thinning and thickening of ever moving line work, gains an intense life of its own, swelling and bursting through the powerful and plastic realization of the demon form. Two stories about Wu Daozi are instructive about Chinese approach to art and beauty. In the first story, the emperor who had commissioned Wu to paint a waterfall on the palace wall, a little later asked the artist to erase his painting <laughs> because at night the noise of the water prevented the emperor from sleeping. In the second story, once he painted a landscape on the wall of the palace, he did not reveal it to the emperor until it was finished. He, and then he pointed to a grotto and clapped his hands. A door opened and the artist stepped into the picture and vanished with it before the eye of the emperor. Uh, Wu Daozi's art paved the way for a group of artists whose painting was done in a few simple brush strokes. Often, the painter would freely splash and spray the ink into the silk. A ninth century critic brought about a contemporary artist by the name of Wang. Whenever he wanted to paint a picture, he would first drink wine, and when he was sufficiently drunk, would spatter the ink onto the painting surface, then laughing and singing. All the while, he would stamp on it with his feet and smear it with his hands, besides swashing and sweeping it with the brush. The ink would be thin in some places, rich in others. He would follow the shape with brush and ink, uh, making them into mountains, rocks, or water. Responding to the movement of his hand and flowering his impulse, he would bring forth clouds and mist, wash in wind and rain. With the suddenness of creation, it was exactly like the cunning of a god. When one examined the painting after it was finished, he could see no traces of the part of the ink. And sometimes he even used dip his hair into a part of ink and pen with his hair. This description always makes me think of the French artist, Yves Klein's work. We just have a major exhibition of uh, his work uh, in Washington, D.C. last summer. And uh, this makes me think of uh, Klein's work such as his uh, anthropometry. Paintings of the female nude made by applying the paint directly to the woman's body and printing her on the canvas, as well as his painting uh, made by letting the wind gently whisk the thin stalks of reeds onto his canvas, as you, this is the result of his painting, or by fire, uh, then this is the painting. I think uh, Klein's work is actually at the same time, it's against the classical tradition in the West. But deep inside is the anxiety of the artist who try to get close to what is real. But in the end, uh, it's very different uh, in its nature to the art I'm going to describe in a moment. Uh, through the uses of the inks of different intensities and shades, plus ever-changing brushwork, uh, gorgeous early spring, 
stated that 1072 has created an effect of dreamlike illusion of light and shadows, suggesting a landscape where the trees are in dense mist when the winter is over and spring is coming, like today. The contours of the mountains and rocks are not sh sharply delineated, but the top of the mountains are rather revealed by the trees behind the clouds. Goshi's mastery of ink and wash is shown not only in his treatment of misty clouds, the cascuro of mountains, and the shapes of the tree trunks and all the roots, but also in the strategic placement of people in the landscape. Let us look at how layers of restless line and fluid washes are, are fused together, how line is used to transform layers of washes into substantial rock, and how rock disappear into water and sometimes uh, seem to float uh, in the air. The signature and the date and the title of the painting, as I mentioned, is 1072. There's some detail of his wonderful rendering of uh, people who seem to be very much oblivious to the surrounding and going about their day-to-day -day life. A building on his experience and understanding of Wu Dao Zheng Guo Xi, on whose work he wrote Inside the Four Comments, the late 11th century statesman and artist Su Shi or Su Dong Po, uh, his theory of literary painting was greatly influenced by his experience in Taoism as well as uh, Chan Buddhism or Zen. In this painting on the screen, we see a glimpse of the internal coherence that imparts dynamic quality to the mass of the rocks by rowing upon itself in the opposite direction from the movement of the tree trunk beside it, making it share in the life of things. Just as Chan Buddhism generally downplay the importance of preparatory discipline, so to Su downplay any specifically artistic training that might be necessary for the scholar painter. But just as the Chan master built on a strongly established sense of discipline in leading the student towards enlightenment, so to Su turn to the scholar's training in calligraphy as an artistic foundation for every educated Chinese would have mastered the discipline of the writing brush. Here the mastery comes when there is no longer any conscious control or direction of the brush, when the cause of the mind and effect of the brush movement are absorbed into a spontaneous unity that must be experienced in order to be understood. As the discipline of Chan living free the mind for indictment, so the mastery of the brush free the hand to catch faithfully the vision that was found in the mind. It was free to do because its discipline had mastered the problem of how Chan enlightenment and artistic revelation were well, thus both based on the foundation of an underlying discipline that had to be first mastered. Once this mastery was achieved, one was free to abandon oneself to enlightenment and artistic expression. There was no need to the conscious seeking or artistic skill. Only the spontaneous brushwork of the liberated hand and mind was important. The artist forgot the conscious artistry of the brush and relied on his hand to spontaneously express the essence that was retained in his mind. This unconscious unit, unity of inner and outer of hand and mind is thus necessary for the expression of the living essence of things. The whole process may be described as this. Forget the conceptualization whether verbal or artistic, and directly confront the essence of things in nature, then all distinction will be wiped away in the fusion of self and object. The artist will be so completely involved in the essence of what he's painting that he will become the object itself. And this is very different 
from the European tradition where there is always a distance between the object and the artist. Uh, Su Dongpo also wrote a, uh, on a bamboo painting but his older contemporary, Wen Tong, that is similar to the painting on the screen. And I quote, when Wen Tong painted bamboo, he saw bamboo, not himself. Nor was he simply unconscious of himself. Trans life, he left his body. His body was transformed into bamboo, creating inexhaustible freshness. Another painting by uh, Wen Tong, as you see on the screen, has been described by Roger Gorper. All the elements of the plants have been drawn with a single confident brush stroke. The sections of the stem and the branches with a firm and elastic writing brush. The counter pressure of was springy type can be felt in the hand. The leaves with a softer and limper brush which submits obediently to the slightest pressure of the hand. The interaction of the graphic forms resulting from these two techniques largely determine the general impression created by the painting. The individual elements becoming fused in the composition filled with tension and vitality. The diagonal upward movement of the stem is answered contrapunctually by the smaller tweaks while the sudden break diverts the thrust from the top left-hand corner and cause it to fade out in the largest blank space in the composition. And in this kind of composition, the space that is not covered by any graphic signs is actually as important as the area that has been touched by the artist. A principle very similar to the calligraphy we have seen, for example, from the hand of Huai Su. So, in perceiving the lead or principle of things, Wen Tong might be said to be perceiving the essence of things. Here, the artist's vocabulary differs from that of Chan Master, but underlying thought structure is strikingly similar. With this accent on spontaneity and lack of conscious skill, it means that the traditional models of art are no longer of prime importance. Everything must have its life that is independent of the past. There are two important implications in just for art making itself. First, with the brush skill that comes from the practice of calligraphy being the basis of the new kind of painting espoused by the scholar, painters, and officials. Subject tend to be those which are open to calligraphic technique. This approach to art was called xie yi, or writing out idea by Su Dongpo and his contemporary. And this approach was to be very influential in the Chinese sense of beauty. Consequently, bamboo, rocks, pines, and orchids becomes important. At the same time, pictorial organization had to be held to an absolute minimum. Simplicity was the key word. The conscious skill needed in organizing larger pictures and vistas was both absent and foreign to the ideas of natural spontaneity. This approach embodied the Taoist ideas in which spontaneity leads to freedom in art. In art is the freedom from illusionism. In life is the freedom from entrenched moral discourse and freedom from the separation of man and uh, nature. And Heir to the Wu Daozi tradition, as seen in the Bodhisattva painting I mentioned earlier, can be found in this painting by Liang Kai from the 13th century. The immortal or sage in this painting by Liang Kai rambles smiling and drunkenly several quick swipes of ink in what's usually called the splashed ink technique, sketch out figure from shoulder to feet while revealing his inner spirit. They incorporate the soul of the painted figures and the spirit of art and the viewer in all age. This painting also exemplifies what Su Dongpo said. To discuss painting in terms of verisimilitude is to be unsophisticated as a child. 
uh, in the West, both classical antiquity and Renaissance culture consider that art possess an essentially illusionistic nature. Michelangelo is described as angry hitting his Moses because the statue would not talk or move. Sunny Diderotai were more interested in our capacity to summon reality and to enter a communion with nature. Some modern Western artists, through intuition, arrive at the conclusion similar to that of the Chinese. For example, Picasso once said, the question is not to imitate nature, but to work like it. Uh, both Xu Wei, the great calligrapher, poet, and playwright of the 16th century, and uh, Shi Tao, the great masters of the 17th century, continue to explore the tradition of Xie Yi, or spontaneity, in art, which actually is the embodiment of the Chinese sense of individual freedom and uh, liberation. The inscription by Shi Tao at the end of this hand scroll entitled the 10,000 Ugly Ink Dots, as we are going to see in a moment. Section. Here's the inscription, and let me uh, read the translation for you. The distant passages are not, the title is at the first four characters, 10,000 Ugly Ink Dots. The direct passages are not in accord with each other. They do not show the turning and the winding movement of mountains and streams. The closer passages are dense and crowded. One can see only the humble village dwellings. When the mind breaks away completely from the restricting framework of established conventions and methods of paintings, one's painting will naturally be like an immortal gliding in the wind that's to say, imbued with a free and trammeled spirit, almost similar to the immortal or sage from Liang Kai we have just looked at. And finally, he said, the skin, that is the brush and ink, and the bone, that is the composition of the painting, will become manifest in a compelling manner, an unearthly spirit, and that is, of course, a sign of separation. Let me close my remarks in this evening's uh, presentation with some comments on an ink painting by Gao Xinjian, who received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2000 after he exiled himself from China and who now lives in Paris. He's also an accomplished ink painter. His style of painting can be characterized as belonging to the great Chinese tradition of Xie Yi, or writing out idea, as I mentioned earlier. This style allows him to create subtle, intuitive settings and characters or objects that move in the limits between figurative and abstract art in a way that has been done by many of the great masters in Chinese art history. His paintings explore the expressive possibilities of ink and washes, the nuanced light and dark shadings, subtle washes, textures, and volumes in this painting are both dramatic and refreshing. The painting is Gao Xinjian's interpretation of a poem by the poet painter Wang Wei of the 8th century. Uh, this poem, by the way, has now almost 20 Western language translations, even though it has only four lines. And I'm reading one of the 20 or so translations. There was no sight of man in the immediate uh, mountain, yet human voice were continuously being heard. The sun reflects the distant scenes into the thick woods, forming patterns on the green moors. Gao Xinjian himself 
wrote about his own work. Even when faced with a market choked with trends and fashions, or an environment saturated with political utilitarianism, if the artist is able to remain unmoved, if he does not compromise, then he will be the type of artist who can create a new aesthetic value and who will continue to write art history. Gauss in painting demonstrates that the Chinese literary tradition pronounced there many times by Chinese critics and foreign observers since the early 20th century is actually alive and well. Returning to the great poet and statesman Su Dong Po, he wrote a poem, A Coin Zhuang Zi, about the monk Lu. In this poem, the partial condition of our perception, pointing out that one must be content with the immediate awareness of the present moment of what is, not of what was or will be in art or in our pursuit of happiness. And this poem goes like this. From one side, the mountain looks rounded. From another, it's pointed. Far, near, high, low. No view is the same. One cannot know the true face of the Lu Mountain only because one is in the mountain. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor Kuo was saying before we came here that he's, he started uh, his interest in, in literature and the combination of poetry and art I think has been wonderful. What a very different tradition from Western art. Uh, the, the importance of spontaneity, but spontaneity built on such, um, such technical skill and, 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 and tough discipline. And what absolutely beautiful images. Um, it, 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 they wouldn't win the Turner Prize. Um, uh, but it makes you think how much Western art is concerned with giving us shocking portrayals of the world outside and how much is to be seen by using art to deepen our understanding of our inner world. In this way, I suppose, um, what Professor Crow has shown us is beauty as a route to happiness. Thank you very much indeed. What if you are interested? I brought a facsimile of the scroll in case you want to come and see it. That's the calligraphy scroll that I showed earlier. And uh, since you cannot fly to the National Paris Museum, easily I brought this for you to take a look <laughs> if you are interested in. And this is also a scarf. <laughs> oh. yes. Thank you.